I got a hilarious one. There's a new one. Rick Rubin sent me this this one. And he's like, this has got to be satire, right? And it's brilliant, brilliant satire. But there's this per- person who has like the best version of a super liberal – uh, like my children will never eat food from a gas stove, like like that, that kind of shit. And there's so many of these. Like it's hard to tell who's who's what and what's real. And it's it's just one of those things where you're you're it's 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 hard when you're looking things through text because people are sneaky. They're really good at it. And people are so ridiculous in real life that a really subtle parody is very hard to discern. So is that hate speech? If someone's doing it as a parody, is that hate speech? Like right. w- when do you decide that something is hateful? And, and that's exactly why traditionally in this country w- w- judges have always said, well they haven't always said it, but they they eventually came around to the idea that we can't involve ourselves in these questions. They're t- they're too difficult, and it's not our job. Um, we're going to step in in only the most extreme cases, right? So the the current standard is, you know, the Supreme Court case Brandon Brandenburg v. Ohio, which outlaws imminent uh, uh, incitement to imminent lawless action, right? So you have to be basically saying. You know, let's go get them. Go, go get them. Let's, Break into know, the White House. Shoot, shoot that person. Like yeah. that's illegal speech, right? Anything short of that, we're gonna stay out of it because it's just too. It's too confusing. It's too right. complicated, right? Like if you start getting into what's satire, what isn't, what's incitement, what isn't, like as we see at companies like Twitter, you know, you can spend endless amounts of time building sandcastles trying to figure out what is what, and yeah. and, and it will always end in, in a place where the government, use, you know, uh, interprets it to its greatest advantage. Yeah. And, and that's why we, you know, we don't want it, <laughs> you know? I mean, it, 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 ultimately, it's not a good thing for, uh, for most people, but... It's just very hard for people to realize... Even though this thing that you're talking about wielding, this weapon, will work against your enemies, it can ultimately also be used against you. That was the thing with the Patriot Act. When the, you know, indefinite detention, when they were were talking about just being able to detain people, and Obama was like, don't worry, well, I would never do that. But you're not going to be in the president forever. Like, someone else is going to come along. And perfect example, that next person was Trump. Right. Well, what if someone's crazier than him? Like, what if something happens? What if there's a some sort of a, a nuke goes off somewhere and then everybody gets way more radicalized and then you can get a really fucking insane, like, a Stephen King character. What was that movie where the, the, the one evil guy becomes president and... Oh, God, the Greg, Greg uh, Stilson. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Dead Zone. Dead Zone, thank right, you. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not far removed from that right. in terms of plausible plots that this wacky country can fall into. And that's the same thing with censorship. Like, they can use it against you. So, like, if you're, you think you're using this to push back against right-wing extremism, they can use that to push back against progressive ideas that would generally benefit, genuinely benefit good people. Right. Genuinely benefit families, genuinely benefit people in need, genuinely benefit people in terms of health care and education. They can stop that. Absolutely. They can stop that if it's unprofitable with the same sort of tools. Absolutely. you got to have free speech. It's the most important thing we have, and it's the one thing that separates us from everybody else. So when you have liberals and progressives that are screaming against removing people from platforms and stopping this and stopping that, understand what the fuck you're saying. Yeah, and they, and they don't, they right? Don't. Yeah, I mean, like... It's just convenience. It'll we, work we, against my enemies. We, we, you talk about uh, how they can use it to shut down things on the other side yeah like, we see reports in in these files of government agencies sending lists of accounts that are accusing the united states of uh vaccine corruption now what they're really talking about is pressuring foreign countries to not use generic vaccines right mm. and you know that's a liberal issue. That's a pro- that's a progressive issue. Uh, like the progressives want generic vaccines to be available to poor countries. Okay, uh, but you know you can you can use this tool to eliminate t- speech about that if you want to. Right. Yeah. Like th- I think that's what they don't get is that the, the significance is not who the significance is the tool. 
Like, what what is it capable of doing? Right. Right? How, uh, how easily is it employed? And, you know, uh, how often is it used? And, 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 and they don't focus on that. They focus on, oh, it's Donald Trump, so therefore we want it. I mean, yeah. that, that's, and that's where their mistake is. It's... It's a very interesting and very nuanced conversation as to what should be allowed and what should not be allowed and why. And I think it's complex and it's ever changing and it depends upon the tools that are involved and it depends upon what's the what are you talking about? And then it also depends upon like here's here's a big one that drives me nuts about this January 6th. Why is it okay for the FBI to have agents that incite people to go into the Capitol? Why is that okay? What benefit is that for society? Like, how much, how much influence did they have? How much rabble-rousing influence did they have? How much coercion? I mean, what, well, why is that okay? So, th so this is another topic that is fascinating because it hasn't gotten a ton of press. But uh, if you go back all the way to the early 70s, the, the CIA and the FBI – gotten a lot of trouble um, for various things. The CIA for assassination schemes involving people like Castro, the FBI for, uh, you know, uh, COINTELPRO and other programs, domestic surveillance. And they made changes after congressional hearings, the church committee, uh, that basically said, the FBI, from now on, you have to have some kind of reason to be following somebody or investigating somebody. You have to have some kind of criminal predicate. And we want you mainly to be in investigating cases. But after 9-11, they, they peeled all this back. There was a series of attorney general memos uh, that essentially refashioned what the FBI does. And now they don't have to be doing crime fighting all the time. Now they can be doing uh, basically 100% intelligence gathering all the time. They can be infiltrating groups for no reason at all, not to build cases, but just to get information. Um, and so that's, that's why, that's why they're there. They're like, they're, they're in these groups. They're, they're posted up outside, outside of the homes of, of people they, who they find suspicious, but they're not building cases. Uh, they're not, they're not investigating crimes. It's sort of like Minority Report, the, yeah. right? It's pre-crime. It's pre-crime. Pre yeah. And, and the public has accepted this, you know, w without much trouble. Yeah, know? there's a little bit of pushback from people online, and then it goes away, where there's no real repercussions. Like the Governor Whitmer case. Right.